Uh, it's great to see so many people interested in Aspen and Black Poplar, more than myself. <laughs> so just the talk will be split basically between the two species, and we'll talk about ecology and conservation in, bo in both sections. So the first thing just to say is Aspen and Black Poplar, they're poplars and they're members of the willow family, um, which is the Salicaceae, and it's about 29 poplar species worldwide. Um, and there's kind of general commonality between the poplar group, they've got a simple leaf, so that a simple roundy leaf, you know, maybe a bit of toothing in some, some species. Um, one of the most interesting things about them is they generally have, are divided, the trees are either male or female, so some trees have, trees have only male flowers and some trees have only female flowers. So um, that's called dioecious, so you have monoecious plants that have male and female flowers in the same plant. And uh, their, their pollen and seed are generally dispersed by wind and they have very, very fast growth and they're also able to reproduce by cloning themselves. So we have two, one definitely na native poplar species in Ireland, which is the aspen, and the second species is black poplar, which there's a question mark over, and we'll, talk, we'll discuss that in the talk. We've got a number of non-native poplar species in Ireland as well, and you have the hybrid poplar, which is half black poplar, half American poplar, and you've got the white poplar, which is closely related to the aspen. You have the balsam poplar from North America, and then you've got the grey poplar, which is a cross between the aspen and the white poplar. So you could say it's kind of half native, half non-native. So we'll start with the, with the black poplar first. Um, there's about, it's, a, it's, it's found throughout Europe. Uh, it doesn't go very far north into Scandinavia. Um, but it's, 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 found, it's, found, it's, it's found in North Africa and it go, goes into the Middle East. And there's about seven varieties or subspecies described based on physical characteristics. Um, the, the subspecies that's thought to occur in Britain and Ireland and Western France is called the uh, subspecies Bitulifolia, birch-like leaves, and it's generally distinguished from the other subspecies by having very hairy um, young leaves and young stems. So this is a uh, this is the black poplar growing actually in Clare Castle in County Clare. Um, you'll tr you, you might try drive past it on, the, on, your, on your way to Ennis or every, every so often. Um, just to kind of give you a, the outline of what, what, a, what a black poplar would look like, um, it tends to be kind of quite a shag, shaggy and leaning in appearance and you have upward sweeping bra branch tips and downward sweeping lower branches and some, some, some trees will have bur burrs in the trunk when they get very old, other, other, other clones don't have it. In terms of the leaf, the leaf is quite diamond shaped with kind of light toothing um, and the base of the leaf is either, is either straight or kind of oblong. And this is just to show you the, the fine hairs, if you, you probably can't see it in this little screen, but it's very, if you look at the, this is a young leaf coming out in spring and you can see the very fine hairs in the stems, which is kind of typical of the, of the black poplar you find in Britain and Ireland and France. So then you've got hybrid poplars as well. Um, this is just a photograph I took from County Offaly of a black poplar and a, and, a, and a hybrid poplar in the hedgerow. The black poplar is the tree on the right hand side and the hybrid poplar is the tree on the left hand side. And straight away the main difference you can see is um, you can really easily see through the canopy of the, of the hybrid poplar. It's much more um, straight in its growth, upwards in its growth. Whereas you can see in the black poplar on the right, it's quite, raggedy and much more wild looking um, and has, has, in, in full summer would have a denser tree canopy. And then when you're looking at the leaves, the hybrids are, um, if you look at the base of the leaf, it's kind of heart shaped or what they call chordate in botanical terms. And in comparison to the black poplar, the, the, the teeth um, on, the, on the leaf margin are much more pronounced. Now you also get the Lombardi poplar which actually is a black poplar. It's just a, it's just a sport of black poplar. Um, it's called Varitalica in Latin, and it's not exactly not from Italy. It's probably from the Middle East, um, but it's just an, a very, very upright clone of black poplar. It's very, very commonly planted. Now, in terms of reproduction, we I talked about male and female trees. So you've got the male catkins, which are red in color, and the female catkins, which are green in color. And then the, the female catkins, if they're, you know, they'll, they'll eat white fluffy, fluffy seeds in June, July. From the, so if you see a tree in June, July covered in cotton, it's, it's a female tree. And one of the tr names for black poplar is the cotton tree or the cottonwood because of the female trees. 
Um, just, just so the seeds, if the seeds land in the right conditions, you get seedlings. But black poplar can also grow from a fallen branch or from cuttings um, relatively easily. So, in terms of its habitat, it's a it's, called, it's, it's termed a pioneer of European uh, river floodplains. So. It, it, it is very specific conditions for the seeds to germinate. It, re, it relies on very dynamic river systems where the channels are constantly changing, there's erosion, deposition happening, um, and you're getting fresh deposition of alluvial soil. And if, if that, if, and in early summer, if the seeds fall on it and it stays damp, you'll get germination of seeds. Um, so just some examples here of some pioneer island on in a river in Italy um, coming out of the Alps with, with young black poplar on it and then just you've got some very old growth black poplar in the um, some floodplain forests on the river Danube in, in, in Serbia and they're associated with two um, habitats of European importance um, so you've got alluvial forests with alder and ash and you've got riparian mixed forests of Pinocchio oak ash and elm. they're both what are classed as annex habitats under European law Um, this is just an uh, example of an alluvial, alluvial forest um, of, in, in the Gare in County Cork. It's one of the best examples of, of, of um, alluvial forest in Europe. But it's a bit of a, it's a tricky woodland be site because it, it's, if you look at it, it's actually like a, just a series of islands with oak ash hazel woodland on them. It doesn't have that kind of alder willow complex that you see in, in, in what's typically considered alluvial woodland. So the Gare is a bit more stable than... Um, than other, than other um, typical alluvial woodland sites. Um, and we can, I'll go into that further um, later on in the talk. You'll also get them in these gallery woodlands, or riparian willow woodlands. This is what I took in the River Barrow in, count, in County Carlow. A wonderful habitat. Now, this white willow there, not black poplar, but you can, um, and on the content, white, pop, white, white willow, sorry, and black poplar would be associated with each other. You know, people are like, what, what use are black poplars? What, what use are they? What, what are they good for? So is either, is either you're talking about timber or talking about biodiversity. So biodiversity, um, we don't really know much about, a lot about the, the biodiversity value of black poplar in Ireland, but in the continent, it's, they, these are big trees in, in, in lowland landscape. They get, these trees can be you know, seven or eight metres in girth when they get old and you know, 30 plus, 25 metres in height. Um, and they get hot, they grow very quickly and they, they hollow very quickly and they lose branches. So um, they're quite good for tree nesting critters like barn owl and goosander and also bats. Um, on the continent, um, there's, a little, there's a beautiful little yellow bird called the golden oriole, which is heavily associated with poplar woods. And then you've got lots of insects that are associated with black poplar. And there's a lot of moth species that are, that are associated with, with poplar. And the most obvious one being the, the poplar hawk moth there on the top left. Um, the, it's in, the invertebrate on the right is actually an aphid, um, it's called uh, the spiral aphid gall and it forms these galls on the stem of a black poplar, it, they create a little home for themselves and they live inside this little, little tent, so that's all little, little aphids living inside the stem of the black poplar. In terms of threats, that, um, look at a European context, um, as I mentioned, they, they need very dynamic river systems in order to be able to reproduce sexually. Um, so loss of floodplain habitat from, through urbaniza urbanization and agriculture. Um, flo lo flood, flo lowland land is in high demand for you know, other land uses, like so obviously farmland being a big one. So floodplain forests have really lost out in terms of that. But also how we've managed the rivers, the, the loss of dynamic river flow, so dredging, levees and dams. Uh, which results in a lack of recruitment um, to sex reproduction. So this is just an example of a river in, uh, in the Rhine that has been arterially drained over the years. Like, you know, they've, they've, you know, they've, they've basically straightened it. So it was once a very complex system of river channels and it's been simplified down to more or less one channel um, through arterial drainage, through levees. So that's a huge issue for black poplar. Um, and then another problem is um, people can start propagating them, but a, they tend to prefer um, growing male trees and female trees because they don't like the, the white fluff from the female trees. So in very in, so in human very human modified landscapes where you get black poplar, you get mostly males are all males and no females. So then hybridization with with the, with the hybrid poplar. It, was, it has been a big concern that we have very large hybrid poplar plantations in close proximity to black poplars 
that there'll be an issue of genetic pollution into the wild black poplar population. There's been a lot of work done in this in, in Belgium, for example, and they found it's only really an issue where, where you've got a female black poplar who has, is, is growing in, there's no male black poplar if he's growing in close proximity. So the nearest thing is, is, is a hybrid poplar, so it'll pollinate. Um, but if you have male black poplars growing in close proximity to a female poplar, it'll preferentially select the, the black poplar pollen. And um, <coughs> there's, more of a, there's more of a worry about actually hybridization between wild black poplar populations and the, the Lombardy poplar, because that is a black poplar. But there is some difference between the, in terms of flowering time between the Lombardy poplar and the, and the black poplar. So again, the, the kind of bottom line is, if you've got a healthy population of male and female trees, it's hybridization is probably not a, a huge issue. It's only really an issue where the population is small and female trees are isolated. So what's the status of black poplar in Ireland? Um, um, so is a massive question mark over whether black poplar is native or not. If you look at the 19th century literature, uh, um, it's kind of thought to just been a, 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 a planted tree associated with um, how, um, settlements. Um, so it was just, it kind of dismissed as, as, a, as a native species. Um, but the first kind of main kind of body of work to look at black poplars um, was, uh, and, uh, in Ireland, was done by a guy called Desmond Hobson, who's a botanist from England, who um, came over with funding from the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland and Trinity College, the Botanical Department of Trinity College Dublin, and did a, a very, very quick um, drive around survey of Ireland um, uh, looking for black poplars and he literally looked, looked at Ireland, looked at maps of Ireland, looked at the river valleys and just selected some road routes, routes to drive around and drove around looking for black poplars and he mapped about 370 trees uh, in, in, in Ireland. Um, so you can just see the di kind of distribution from his survey there was it's Principally a midland species, and uh, you also get, you get some trees in the southeast, but it's really heavily associated with the Shannon the Shannon system. And he found a hot spot hot spots in the, in the mid Shannon, around Kappa uh, and and the Kilcrow, Kilcrow River, around Portumna basically. And um, so he generally found trees were found away from human habitation, but growing in hedgerows and ditches in floodplains and river valleys. So based on that. Um, he he th thought that he felt that black poplar were worthy of native status. The, one, the interesting, the other thing that made him think that they could be native to Ireland was the fact that he found two sites where he found possible sexually, reprodu sexually reproducing populations. He found seedlings growing on the lake shore of Loch Allen and Loch Ree. Um, so these are just photographs of of, um, lock, of trees on Loch Allen that I've taken. Um, this is the biggest black poplar in Ireland. Uh, it's found in Spencer Harbour. It's got a girth of seven metres. It's a massive tree. Um, that's just a, fe a female further down the lake and just very, very far away here, there's a, a juvenile black poplar growing in the lake shore there. Um, and when you go to Loch Allen, like there's black poplar all, all around the lake shore. Like, you know, it's very common there, you know. Can we not determine from pollen cores? Pollen cores are difficult because um, po poplar pollen doesn't survive for very, doesn't preserve well. But we can talk. I'll talk about it later on. But um, not great. And they, even even in Britain, where they assume it's native, that they they don't have any kind of evidence of long term presence. Um, so so then Kevin Keary, he's he's a uh, he was working for Chagas. He's now working for the Forest Service uh, in Clare. He did a survey. Um, he resurveyed some of. Uh, Desmond Hobson's old records, and uh, and did want, but he doubled up with some genetic research. So he looked at trees in Dublin, Kildare, Offaly, Tipperary, and Galway, and he worked with um, Forest Research. They're this kind of research branch of the, of the Forestry Commission based in Scotland, um, and they carried genetic fingerprinting to determine how many clones uh, are, were, were were present in Ireland and. Um, to, and to see if, how many were pure and how many were hybrids. Um, so when we talk about cl clone lines, basically, like so, if, if you have me, I'm one. I mean, I, I'm an individual. But if you cut my hand off and stuck it in a pot and grew, grew another me, there'd be two of us. We'd be a clone line. So he found nine clone lines. So 
he, ha he found around 80 plus trees were pure black poplar and among the, it, it, when we looked at the genetics of those 80 plus trees he found that they belonged to just nine clone lines so he found that there was very low genetic diversity um, uh, in the Irish black poplar population. So, is, so the kind of question is, is the black poplar native to Ireland and um, the second question is if the black poplar is not native to Ireland is, it, is the Irish population of conservation importance worthy of further protection, research, you know, investment? Important questions. So this comes to my research. This is something I've just been doing in my spare time. Um, since 2017, I've been reviewing and resurveying all the old records for black poplar in Ireland. So that's Desmond Hobson's records, Kevin's records, and other records from the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. And what I've been aiming to is generate accurate GPS locations um, and a photographic record of all these trees. And I've also, with funding from the Royal Irish Academy, uh, for two years I've, uh, I've been carrying out genetic research, um, further, further, furthering Kevin's research, um, looking at the rest of the range of the black poplar in Ireland to look at um, the genetics of black poplar in Ireland to compare it to Irish trees, to British trees and continental trees um, to see if there is some evidence that either it's introduced or is there evidence of long-term isolation. And then the last kind of aim of my work was coming out of that genetic work, um, um, setting up a national clone collection uh, of black poplar. So we identify all the clones that are present in Ireland, propagate them and um, have a national clone, clone stand that you can use to propagate black poplar trees and plant them back out into the wild, uh, males and females together um, of different clones to kind of kickstart a wild population again if the if the conditions are there. Um, so um, I've been using um, a, a, a app on my phone called Map at GIS, which is just a, 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 G, a GS a little GIS program on your phone that you can actually design a survey. Um, you can just design a, a form basically on, on the app and fill in whatever details you want. Um, it, tags, it tags a GPS location to each record and you can also take a photograph and it tags that photograph to that record, which is brilliant. So, you know, we're looking for old trees. This is a, this is a tree from a postcard in Escarthy. Um, there's a black poplar just here. Um, that's called the cotton, it was called the cotton tree locally. It was kind of associated with the Battle of There was always a, a, a tree there. Whether that, where did that tree date back to the Battle of Vinegar Hill? Vinegar Hill is doubtful, but there was some kind of association with this tree and the Battle of Vinegar Hill. That tree doesn't exist anymore, it was cut down. Um, but because a lot of Desmond Hobson's records came from roadside, I decided to use Google Street View to see if I could refine some of these trees. And the problem with Desmond's records was he didn't give proper grid references. It's very, you know, he talks about townlands and five miles east of this crossroad. And so basically you're looking for a townland and you're driving around looking for a tree. Now they're very distinct looking trees so you can't spot them. So I just drove around on Google Street View in some of the general locations to see if I could spot a tree. So this is just an example of a tree in Athlone, um, that's St. Vincent's Hospital. And this is just a female black poplar growing um, on a laneway here. And when I came back to do the survey, the, the tree was still there. It's still there, thankfully. Um, so I just, uh, this is the final, I've nearly finished the field work. Um, um, I've just got some work to do in South Kildare and Wexford. Um, but the field work of, of, uh, for the survey is more or less complete, but I've generated just under 600, uh, under 700 records of black poplar in Ireland. And um, the distribution is pretty much similar to how Hobson found it, but I've extended the distribution in, into North Cork and into, into County Kerry as well. I don't know if Desmond actually even surveyed Kerry, but if you look at Scully's flora from the, from the early 20th century, he talks, he mentions black poplar, but he mentions them as a, as a planted tree. Um, so yeah, um, distribution is more or less the same. Um, I just want to show you this. Um, I just did, you, can, you can generate a heat map to see where kind of records are, are, are kind of concentrated. So just like Desmond Hobson, there's a concentration in, in the mid Shan around Loch Derg. Um, really, really high density of, of, along the Barrow in two locations as well, um, around the Leash, Leash, um, Leash Kildare border and the North Carlow Leash Kildare border. And then of course, you've got that's Loch Allen basically, um, where there's the concentration of records there. In terms of wild growing trees, the, the Loch Allen trees are still there and you know, they're doing very, very well. Um, but um, 
I also discovered uh, a clonal stand of black poplar on Loch Mask on an island called White Island. I was working with my colleagues uh, Owen McGreal and John Higgins in the National Parks and Wildlife Service and we were actually looking for osprey. We weren't looking for black poplar at all but we went down to this island on Loch Mask where there was a sighting of an osprey and we went down to the lake shore and we just happened to spot the tree. <laughs> so um, that, that was a new, lo a, new, a new location for black poplar and further work on Loch Mask but by um, Owen and another ranger, Irene O'Brien, they found two old black poplar trees growing on an island on Loch Mask as well. Um, another, another location um, for, for, for a while, a new location, was one tree on Loch Derg, on the eastern shore of Loch Derg. There's one tree, grow, again, just growing clonally along the, along the lake shore. Now, Loch Ree was worrying. Um, I only found one, one wild growing tree on Loch Ree at the southern end at Cousan Point, just growing on the lake shore. Um, but there's a place called Rinner Du Bay on the eastern side of Loch, Loch Ree that Hobson mentions there being saplings growing um, on, the, on the lake shore. When I went there, there's, there's no black poplar at all whatsoever. I don't know what's happened there, but there's no, no black poplar trees there anymore. So, like, that's the actual distribution of black poplar in Ireland because these are the wild, wild growing trees, self sustained populations. I mean, I've ma I, the other map is just a map of trees. You, you can map monkey puzzle trees in Ireland and you have a distribution for monkey puzzles. But in terms of functioning wild populations, that's the distribution of black poplar, you know. So it's concentrated around Loch Allen, then a few outliers basically. All the other trees that I've came, come across are, are obviously planted trees. They're growing in hedgerows, they're growing in ditches. You know, the, these aren't places that the seed of black poplar would, would germinate and grow. They're, these are planted trees. Alistair, you had a question there? Yeah, how did you distinguish between the wild and the... Just in terms of where they're, grow where they're, where they're situated, like they're, they're growing, these, these trees are growing on lake shores and they're reproducing clonally along the lake shore. Now, it's possible that they could have been planted originally and then just naturalised, um, or they just seeded in and are growing, growing. but they're, they're growing in the wild and they're kind of reproducing in the wild, either through sex reproduction or, or clonal reproduction. Um, this is the distribution of male trees and female trees. Um, most of the trees are male. You, you, there was a very high concentration of female trees on that kind of North Carlow, South Leach, Kildare border. Um, um, a few, few females come up to Shannon and you've got, you got male trees and female trees in Loch Allen, which again would support the fact that sexual reproduction is happening in Loch Allen. Um, so just going to the genetic research, so I, what, I've, what I've done here, for, I've, 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 again I've collaborated with um, Forest Research in Scotland um, to, do, to do DNA fingerprinting. So they've been working on British black poplar populations for years, so they have a clonal database of all the black poplar trees found in Britain. So we can cross-reference the black poplar clone lines found in Ireland to see if any of them are also found in Britain. And uh, so what I've done is I've I've, I've combined my results with Kevin's results from the early 2000s. So these four clones here, which are the most common clones you come across in Ireland, these four clones are also clones that are very commonly found in Britain. So um, ver very, very widespread and would indicate that there's movement of trees between um, Britain and Ireland. Um, but then there's these clones that are all just found in Ireland or unique, unique to Ireland. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're native. It just means that, you know, they have they could they could also have been found in Britain and don't occur there anymore, um, or they they were they, they could just they could be very very closely related to the to the the clones that are found also found in Britain, or they could be indicative of of native clones, and. This is just to look at Loch Allen. Um, this is not the most up-to-date map. I've, I've, I've added more trees since, but so all, all, all the, all the on the lake shore of Loch Allen, um, all, all the, the clones were unique to Loch Allen, and every tree was a, was a unique clone. Um, but I've, I've updated the results there, and I found some some evidence of, cl kind of two trees being the same clone on the, on the uh, just around here on the western side of the lake. But most of the trees are their own unique clone, which would suggest to me that there's it's very obvious. You've got male and female trees on Loch Allen. You've got you, you, you've sampled the trees. They're all individual. They're all different clones. Sex, reprodu sex reproduction is happening on Loch Allen. You know, it's it's pretty obvious. So, um, and in a, in a in a British and Irish context, there's no there's no sexually or wild wild populations of black poplar in Britain. So you know this population. I think even if, the, if, if it wasn't native, it's still a very very interesting thing to have this sex reproducing population of black poplar on Loch Allen. 
So is black poplar native? Um, my results so far suggest that there's been definitely a lot of movement of or importation of British clones into Ireland. And uh, this is all linked back to the, the ten and tree planting of the 18th century and the 19th century. Um, and there's a very good paper by William Smith on that. I mean, there was thousands and thousands of trees brought into the country. And they, they were you know, of all different species. And they select, they, they, they posited, they negatively, just, they did not want native Irish trees. They thought they were crap. They wanted trees from Britain, from England, Scotland, and France, and Germany. And they didn't want anything to do with Irish, Irish stock. It was, it was deemed inferior. So not just black poplar. I mean, you know, a lot of oak you see, a lot of ash you see. Is, you, know, you, know, you know, in some of the kind of more formal planned landscapes in Ireland are probably non-native stock. Now, interestingly, when you look at the biodiversity, so if you look at the, I'll we'll go back to the Gaera again, because there's no black poplar in the Gaera at all. And as a colleague said to me, well, surely if it was native, it would be in the Gaera. Now, if you look at, so there was, there was work done on, on, they did pollen studies um, in the Gaera back in the early 90s. So they looked at recent pollen layers and they, went, they did a core and they looked at pollen in the uh, medieval period and they looked at the kind of species that were found. And interestingly, in, in the medieval period, there was poplar pollen found. Now, you can't distinguish between black poplar and aspen in terms of pollen. You can say poplar, that's all you can say, like, you know. So, but the other thing that they found in the, in, in the Gera in the medieval period was hornbeam, you know, which is really interesting. And, that's, that wasn't, and both species are absent in the, in the modern layers, and there's no hornbeam around that part of Cork anymore. But the fact that you've got hornbeam pollen from the, you know, this is a tree that's assumed to be non-native uh, in the Gera in the medieval, medieval period is very, very interesting. Now, I was chatting to the, our divisional ecologist um, uh, in National Parks, Jervis Good, who's done a lot of work on the Gera. And there was a PhD done on the Gera um, with Simon Harrison, and they did cores. And they, look, they, they looked at the, the soil in the, in, in the, on some of the islands in the Gera. And soil doesn't start to build up on the, in, in those islands until, the, until from the medieval period onwards. So what seems to have happened is you have soil built up on the islands and they've stabilised and formed these oak ash hazel woodlands, basically. They're not alluvial woodlands in the strict sense. So potentially there was, you know, black poplar or aspen, you know, growing in those, in those forests when they were more dynamic, when there was more gravelly islands on, on, in the Gera. But as, as the islands have stabilised and soil has built up, it's gone to oak, oak woodland, basically. And there's another interesting tidbit, um, in terms of Irish log boats, um, so, so there was a there was a, lo a, lo a log boat um, found in the Shannon Estuary in the early 90s. It was radio radiocarbon dated to the Bronze Age, and the archaeologist identified it as poplar. I've been trying to contact him, but he won't talk to me. So I don't know what the I don't know what the crack is there. But again, another, another interesting tidbit. But um, it, you know, in terms of what what would we what would what would show that the black poplar is native? So, you know, evidence from before the the 18th century plantings, basically, like you know, so um, you know, uh, either carbon dated pollen, or you know, leaves or twigs of black poplar from before the 18th century, or if you're looking at the genetic work, if the Irish trees are really really different from the British trees. Um, and the continental trees. Um, that would again suggest that they've been on Ireland for a longer period than the, than the um, 18th century. So it's not resolved. You know, I think for what I'm hoping to do is uh, I've got, you know, I've built, built what, what, the next step with the genetic work is we're going to be looking at, looking at related, we're going to do related this analysis between the Irish, Irish only black poplar clones and the British, other British clones and continental clones to see, you know, are the Irish clones very, very different or are they just a subset of British clones? So um, we'll see what happens with that. Um, if we were to, you know, it, you know I, do, I do think still though that even if um, black poplar aren't found to be native, I would argue that there is a conservation value in having them in, 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 the, in, the, in the trees in Ireland. I think the, at the very, very least, the, the Lock Island population is actually very important because wild sexually reproducing populations of black poplar are actually very, very rare, and certainly in the British and Irish context. And look, um, we know that probably um, crayfish aren't native. Um, they were probably introduced 
um, you know, by the monks in the medieval period, and, and they're they're highly protected now. So, um, you know, I, I will try and make an argument, and you could easily not make an argument and say no, that doesn't they have, they have no value. But I I make an argument. I mean, that, the, that at the very least, I think the the Loch Allen population is worthy of protection, if they're you know if you know if, if, if even if they're not found to be na- not native, like you know, um, so. What could you do to try to improve the situation? So in terms of in situ conservation, you could, you're talking about legal protection. So either putting black poplar under the floor protection order, or you could designate Loch Allen as, as an NHA. You know, there's other things about Loch Allen that are very important as well. You know, there's very important grasslands as well. Um, there's, there's, no, there's, no, any, there's no legal designations for, for Loch Allen. And then you're looking at restoration of floodplain forests and dynamic river processes. So just an example here of the, the Dutch room for the river scheme. So they've basically been undoing the arterial drainage works for the last, you know, nearly century, like in allowing the river to expand, re-wiggling the river, some people call them re-wiggling the river, making the river dynamic again. So you get erosion, deposition, new islands, and then you would get male and female black poplars from different clone lines and plant them together and hope they make babies, basically, like, you know. Um, so, um, so yeah, you know, out of my work, you know, I've, you know, I have identified all the clones that are found in Ireland. I'm propagating them in fish boxes in my garden. Um, that's all. They're all black, different clones of black poplar there, um, growing in fish boxes in salt lake buckets. And um, you know, if some, if if, if a state organisation or somebody, you know, if if they fight, if if they, you know, agree with me that black poplar are worthy of protection, we could, you know, we could, you could establish a national clone orchard grow stools and coppice them and you can plant the, cu- the, the, the cuttings as trees basically like you know be and you'd, ma- you'd plant you plant mixed mixed clones mixed sexes together and uh, try and establish new populations and uh, suitable sites so i've worked with the bride project uh, in in county cork um we planted um i think seven different clone lines male and female trees together um on some of the bride farms um to try and stabilize the riverbank with myself and Tony Nagel was planting some trees there back early in the spring. Um, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah. So uh, the, yeah, the aspens. The aspens is, is a quicker one. So we we'll, we'll move on to the aspens. So, um, so six species glo- globally, um, and Populus tremula is the only species found in Europe. Um, white poplar is very closely related, and they form a hybrid called. Uh, uh, grey poplar, and you have two species of aspen in North America: the quaking aspen and the big toothed aspen. Um, just, just are, these are just examples of aspen growing in Ireland. You, what you'll you'll notice that there's different different clone lines to different growth patterns. So you've got this lovely roundy crown, drooping branched aspen here in the borough in County Clare. This is a more, a more upright tree growing in Uchtedard in Galway, and this is a, another upright tree growing in. Um, uh, in County Cork near Mallow, and you'll find different physical differences between the clones. You'll get some tree. You, 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 you can get some. They, they, the bud burst can happen at different times of the spring, and they can. You know, they, the, the the autumn colours can be different as well. Um, looking at the leaves, a simple leaf like the like the black poplar, but a very very toothed um, leaf, and the the stem is flattened, which causes the the, stem, the, the leaf to shake, and if you look at the mature trees, you get these diamond studs in the bark. It's very distinctive. So we'll see if this works. This is an aspen stand growing in Clare National Park. Um, I don't know if this will work or not. Now we'll give it a go. Some they still haven't cracked his videos that actually play in. <laughs> no, I don't think this is good. No, computer says no. We we'll move on. Um, it's lovely. It's lovely. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so again, like the black poplar, male and female uh, trees, um, airborne seeds. But um, unlike the black poplar, it grows from root suckering, not from branch branch cut, cuttings. So you're 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 growing them from the roots. So you'll see loads of suckers coming up. We saw it this morning uh, in in the woodland. There was uh, root suckers coming up all over the woodland in places. Um, this is just an, this is an aspen site in my range area in Kerry near Glenflesk. It's a lovely, lovely woodland, and this is just the black. Uh, the aspen are growing along the cliff here, and you you know they're, they're all the same clone because they all look quite similar, all kind of straight up, up quite upright, and of similar age. And 
they're all kind of gone golden coloured. I mean, you could have another, if you had a different clone up here, it could still be in green or it could have lost sleeves by now. So that's all the same clothing growing along the cliff there. And they're all connected at the root. And this is kind of an extreme example of that. This is the trembling aspen stand in Pando in Utah. Uh, this, is, this is thought to be the largest living or organism in the, in the world. That's all one tree root system, basically, mm -hmm. like, you know. And that, so that root, they reckon that root system's been alive for 80,000 years. And it's declining because of overgrazing. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's act, it's actually under threat at the moment because of overgrazing, but it's an absolutely spectacular. So yeah, like you have that kind of amazing wow effect because they're all the same clone, they all change leaf color at the same time. And aspen, you know, even the Irish aspens, they tend to always go yellow or golden or red in the autumn and they're really spectacular. Um, in terms of habitat, they're shade intolerant, poor competitor, and they tend to kind of avoid peat soils. So you, uh, you tend to get them growing in cliffs or escarpments on the edges of bogs or along rivers, basically. That, that's, that's where you find them. Um, very little work has been done on the biodiversity of Aspen in Ireland, but in, there's been a lot of work done on the biodiversity of Aspen in Scotland. And there's lots of Aspen specialist species they found in Scotland, um, such as um, the most famous one is this little fella. It's the um, it's it's a it's a it's a fly associated with um, it's a hoverfly associated with it's an aspen hoverfly, and it it needs rotting um, rotting aspen basically to for, to, to breed. Um, this there's a little le there's a there's a leaf mining moth called the aspen leaf miner that is found in Ireland. And if you get if you find an aspen leaf in the autumn and it's yellow, but there's a patch of green in it. That's because there was a caterpillar of, the, of that moth living in it. So if you, if you know of any aspen, keep a lookout for that because that's not a very common species, but massive knowledge gap in terms of the biodiversity associated with aspen. Um, old aspen trees are really rare in Ireland. This is an old aspen tree with branches, with dead, dead wood in it in Clyde National Park, and they are few and far between in Ireland. You, most of the aspens you see are young, young, young trees, um, and that's just a result of, our, of, of the history of woodland cover in Ireland. So in terms of threats, um, aspen are very tasty, very high protein, so overgrazing is a big issue. Um, and where these species like to grow, you get a lot of sheep, you get a lot of goats. So this is, a, this is an aspen clone growing uh, in Killary Harbour in County Mayo, at the front, below in Wheeler A. And they're just hanging, in, hanging on here um, on the cliff face. Um, but like spectacular place, but not in good shape. Um, like the... Like the, the black poplar, you tend to kind of get one clone line in one in, 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 in location now. So male and female trees tend to not to be very close together in the landscape. So there's very little opportunity for, 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 for pollination of female flowers. So that, that is a massive issue. Um, the status of Aspen, I mean, there's been no systematic work done on Aspen in Ireland. So a lot of records are opportunistic. Um, but it's, gener it's generally considered quite widespread. Um, but the kind of... A lot of these trees could be planted as well. That's the Paul Green effect. I don't know if you've heard Paul, Paul Green. He's a botanist down in Waterford who's a prolific recorder. So that's recorder effort. But um, Donegal, for, in terms of wild trees, Donegal is, is, a real, is a real stronghold for Aspen. And uh, you see a lot, a lot of it in comparison to other places. A lot of it around Killarney as well. But they're scattered everywhere. You, if, if, if you've anywhere with kind of, kind of cliffy, rocky ground or a bog, you'll see, you'll see Aspen, like, you know. Um, but when, in the 2003 Native Woodland Survey, it was only found in 5% of woodlands. Um, and, it's, and because of that, it's, it's, it's thought to be considered possibly an, an indicator of ancient woodland. Um, so, but it's, it's likely under-recorded as well. So in terms of, there's lots of knowledge gaps in terms of Aspen. So there's, we, we need a better understanding of the habitat preferences, why it's so rare here. Are there mixed sex stands that are reproduced in Ireland? There could be in Donegal, which would be very worth looking at. What's the age structure of Aspen stands in Ireland? What's the genetic diversity of Aspen in Ireland? There was some work done in, in Queen's University a couple of years ago, but it hasn't been published. Um, what are the status of stands in the uplands? Um, and are there other Aspen specialists in Ireland um, and have some been extir extirpated? Are they extinct? I think probably the Aspen hoverfly was found in Ireland, but it doesn't occur, any occur here anymore. Um, so we look at the conservation strategy for Aspen, we really should be following the Scots. The Scots have done loads of work on Aspen because they've realised it's, realized it's a key, key species in the Caledonian pine forest and it was likely a key species in, in a lot of upland, upland woodlands in Ireland as well. And so what they've been doing is they've been mapping, looking for, uh, mapping all the 
Aspen clonal stands in Scotland and they've been, like I've been doing with the black poplar, genotyping them, identifying unique clone lines, um, propagating them and uh, you can actually sex um, aspens. One of, the, one of their problems they found with aspen in Scotland is they don't really flower very frequently. And that could be a problem in Ireland too. We just don't know. But they, um, so they've, there's, a, there's a group called the Highland Aspen Group, but also Trees for Life do work, a lot of work on, on aspen as well. And they basically, what they've, what they've done is they've gotten aspen clone lines, male and female clone lines um, across Scotland and propagated them in polytunnels. And they've been torturing the trees to kind of stimulate flowering. They, they, they found that if you nick them and attack them, it kind of stimulates flowering. And they think it could be possibly related to maybe insect attack or maybe actually beaver, because beaver are, it's aspen is beaver's favorite food. Um, that maybe if a beaver started gnawing an aspen tree, it might stimulate flowering. I mean, um, obviously if, if, if the stem gets cut down, it, it'll snow suckers as well, but it may also flower. And uh, so they've started to, re they've started to, to um, produce um, aspen saplings from seed production, which is a lot easier to do than uh, uh, um, growing, them, growing them from roots. I'll go through how you do that in a minute. Um, so I think this is something that we need to be doing in Ireland. Um, you know, to, it, it's a species that does probably need assistance. You know, it's a species that suffered, it's, it's, been, it's probably been heavily impacted by deforestation and, and grazing. Uh, I think it does need kind of that kind of intervention, like cur like the, like the curlew would need, you know. Um, so just as a uh, finally, just to talk, I want to talk about when I was working as a conservation ranger in the west of Ireland. I did a lot of work with Sam Birch, uh, who's who's based in uh, the national park formerly known as Ballycroy National Park, which is now Wild Neffa National Park. Um, so when, when I started in the service. Uh, um, we just national parks have just taken over the Quilcha side. Uh, uh, it was supposed to be kind of a joint project between Quilcha and uh, and, and Ballycroy National Park to manage this wild Neffin area, um, but now it's, it's since it's all been encompassed into into what's called now called Wild Neffin National Park, and we were very interested in trying to do native woodland trials in Wild Neffin, and I was and I was very interested in seeing if we can get aspen uh, going in Wild Neffin. Um, so what I initially did was I, I located um, aspen stands in, in West Galway and Mayo and harvested root suckers, um, suckering, suckering saplings. So these, was, these were all part of a root system and I cut them off and, and we planted those. Um, um, oh yeah, so, we, so that was what we initially did, um, growing, um, literally harvesting root suckers and uh, root, root, um, suckering saplings and, and planting them in, wild, in, in the National Park. Um, but more recently, what I started to do is um, locate trees. Especially, this is a tree that we actually found um, on the Bangor Trail, um, right in the middle of the Neffin Beg Range wilderness. Just one aspen tree um, with some suck trees suckering along, along a river. And I actually think these trees grew because of the destocking in the early uh, after the uh, Neffin Beg Range was very heavily overgrazed. There was a period of time where they stopped grazing them because they were so badly overgrazed. And I think that gave these trees a chance to get away, as I say, get away. So I've been, I, you basically dig the roots out and cut them up, I put, put them into a fish box and bury them. And then these should send out shoots in the springtime. Now, what the Highland Aspen group and what Trees for Life would do is um, as the shoots come up, they'd harvest the shoots, put them in rooting hormone, pot them up and have them in a, they'd miss them. Um, so they're constantly getting moisture until they're rooted. I can't afford that. I don't have that. So I've I've just been growing them from roots, root, from root cuttings basically. Like so, they, you know, each one of these will send out multiple stems, and they'll eventually go into saplings, um, uh, and we'll plant them out. Um, so wild Neffin is a very an area of very very intense grazing pressure. You've got a lot of sheep and a lot of deer. Um, so you know we've so we've 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 trialed two we've trialed two planting strategies. So we've planted um, trees. In, so there's a lot of old borrow pits. Again, as I said, like these trees don't like peat. So you're talking about min mineral soils. Um, so these are borrow pits in in the Quilcha site um, where the subsoil is exposed. So this would be a perfect site for aspen. Um, so we planted them there, and we've also planted them along the river, and we planted them in, in tubes tall enough, um, tall enough for deer to to not, to to not be able to get them. But we've also trialed um, this, and, and, uh, this is something that we've 
I, I saw um, online, uh, there's a guy called the Tree Shepherd who plants trees in um, herbivore rich landscapes uh, with no tree gardens or anything like that. So he, you do this thing called saber planting where you, if you get a, you know, two, uh, a big enough sapling on a steep slope, plant it at an angle sticking out. The theory is the tip of the sapling is out of reach from the grazer. So we've, we have two locations in Neffin, Wild Neffin National Park where we, where we planted, that, planted them like that. And the saber planting seems to be working. This is just one here, just um, coming up and start. It'll, it'll, when the tree gets old, it'll be coming up like that and it'll grow up like that. Um, I think the tree, the tree tubes are working, but what we did find, we, we, there's a very, very high mortality rate, but if, if you, if you harvest, harvest suckering saplings and just plant them out straight away, we found we only had about a 50% survival rate, but we, were, we had bad luck as well because we, we planted most of the trees in 2018. It was that really hot summer. Um, even, and even up there, there was very little rainfall and I think the tubes probably cooked the trees as well. So there was a lot, a lot of trees that came into leaf and then they got cooked inside the tubes basically. Like, so just have to, you know, if, you know, we, you know, if one of those trees survives and the grazing pressure reduces, you get loads of suckers. It'll be brilliant, like, you know, so. And we're hoping as well because we've gotten aspen from different parts of, Connacht, there'll be male and female trees and there might be some sexual reproduction in the future. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Um.